This lecture is about the heart. The heart is about the size of your fist, and it's in the mediastinum between the second and fifth rib on the intercostal space, on the superior surface of the diaphragm, two thirds to the left mid sternal line, and to the vertebral column posterior to the sternum, and it's enclosed in a pericardium, which is a double wall sac. Okay, you can see the picture here. You have a, the mid sternal line and your heart and it just basically if you put your fist over where you think your heart is that should be a pretty good example for you. This has been dissected out and you can see the major arteries and as you notice here heart has not been is not where you might think it is it's over to the left of it. The pericardium has a superficial fibrous pericardium. It's very thick, very tough, protects, anchors, and prevents overfilling of the heart. Now, the two-layered serous pericardium has the parietal layer that lines the internal surface of the fibrous pericardium and the visceral layer, which is actually the epicardium or the external surface of the heart. It's part of the heart itself, separated by just a tiny bit of fluid in the pericardial cavity, decreases friction and lets the heart beat nicely. Now, this is a bit strange to put a picture of a cow up, but I put a cow up for a reason. Humans can get infection in their pericardium and they're deathly ill and often die. Uh, however, cows are a bit different. This part right here is one of their four stomachs. It's called the rumen, and it is like a giant fermentation vat. And occasionally, the cow will actually eat uh, a nail. The nail might be slightly bent. I can do a good nail there, like that. And it goes into the, as I eat it, it goes down their gut, down their mouth, into their esophagus, and lands by gravity into the body of this and goes through the diaphragm and into the pericardial sac, filling the pericardial sac with uh, food contents, bacteria, protozoans, basically rotting hay and feed. Uh, one would think that the outcome of this would be the immediate death of the cow, but the actual outcome is the, uh, the people say, hey, doc, we ain't doing right. Now, I just, I know this, you're not mostly cattle people, but I wanted to show you the startling difference in the species. It's created by feeding the cow a couple of magnets. The magnet actually pulls the I'm trying to go back here, actually pulls the uh, nail out of the pericardium back here into the rumen and it sits there forever. And occasionally it might require surgery, but in general, no. Uh, it pulls it out, the, the pericardium drains, and the cow does just fine. It's pretty crazy. What's going to happen with a human? You're going to have a severe, severely sick individual. Okay, the epicardium, as we mentioned before, is the serous, uh, the visceral layer of the serous pericardium. So it's just the outer lining of your heart. Myocardium, myo means muscle, so it's the muscle layer of your heart. Myo, muscle. Spirals of cardiac muscle and a fibrous skeleton. It crosses and interlaces with connective tissue. It anchors the heart muscle and supports vessels and limits the spread of action potentials to specific paths that they need to follow. The endocardium is an inner layer and it is continuous with the endothelial lining of vessels. We have four chambers. The two upper chambers are your atria and they're separated internally by an intraatrial septum. 
And then the ventricles are your lower section. Coronary sulcus, also known as atrioventricular groove, separate, encircles the junction of the atria and the ventricles and separates them. The auricles are extensions of the atria. Auricle means ear, and they're just little extra flaps. The ventricles are the two lower chambers, and they're separated by the interventricular septum. And the anterior and posterior interventricular sulci mark the position of the septum externally. Okay, back to our atria. These are receiving chambers, always. The walls are ridged by pectinate muscles, and the right atrium receives blood that's ready to be oxygenated. oxygenated. This is what I'd call used blood superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus from the heart. Now, vessels entering the left atrium are right and left pulmonary veins, and this has already been oxygenated. And this is a nice dissected picture. And if you see, your right atrium is here. Your right ventricle is here. This is your tricuspid valve as okay so the blood comes in through this superior and inferior vein cava comes into the right atrium goes through the tricuspid and then goes out of the right ventricle into the pulmonary trunk and then it, the pulmonary trunk will then bifurcate which means go two directions and go to feed both lungs now we about in the next chapter, I'll point it out while we have a picture. If one has a deep vein thrombosis, say an ephemeral vein, and it turns loose, it's going to end up in the inferior vena cava, come into the heart nicely, go through the tricuspid nicely, go nicely through here, and if it's big enough, it's going to get stopped right here. And when it does that, that's a saddle thrombus, is what we call it. And what does that, it makes you immediately die because you have no circulation to your lungs. Okay, looking at this picture again, the left side of your heart has your mitral valve here. So blood comes in through the pulmonary veins into the left atrium, mitral valve, and then it goes out through the aortic valve, through the aorta, and out to the body. You'll notice here, your interventricular septum is thick, as is in the entire wall of the left ventricle. The left ventricle has to work very hard to pump blood through to the entire body. The right heart only goes to the pulmonary circulation, so the muscles don't have to be as big. The reason this septum is so large is because we, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So it is basically has to be big to be a part of the left heart. Otherwise, it would bulge out and wouldn't work properly. Okay. And the heart is a two, it's basically two side by side pumps. The right for pulmonary circuit and takes blood to the lungs. The left side is for systemic circulation. Takes blood that's already been oxygenated out to the body tissues. And this is showing a nice picture of the whole entire thing. You have, if you start here, it's systemic, you come into your, my picture's better, something like yellow, I think. Okay, here we go. You go from the systemic circulation into your right atrium, through your tricuspid valve, then you go out through your pulmonic valve, it goes out to pulmonary circulation. It's oxygenated, then it comes in to the left atrium through the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. Nobody says bicuspid really. And then through the aortic valve, systemic circulation, and we could just go round and round and round and round all day long. And you do, that's what your blood does. Equal volumes are pumped into both sides, but the pulmonary circuit is shorter and lower pressure. Systemic circuit 
has a much more resistance, much longer pathways. And that is why we have the anatomical differences. As you see, we have our left ventricle here is very thick, right ventricle is very thin. Uh, coronary circulation is a functional blood supply to the heart, and the arterial supplies may have collaterals, anastomoses, so you get extra delivery. Okay. Arteries include your right and left coronary artery, which are going to be in your, inter, in your atrioventricular groove, marginal circumflex, anterior intravicular arteries, veins, small cardiac, anterior cardiac, and great cardiac veins. Angina pectoris. This is thoracic pain, chest pain, uh, generally caused by a fleeting deficiency in the blood delivered to the myocardium. Um, if one has a total myocardial infarction, a heart attack, they're going to have angina pectoris times 10. It's going to continue. And um, generally, they have great pain. Some people may just be short of breath. Some people may have referred pain into their left arm, hand. Some individuals may just feel nauseated. But the longer the coronary arteries are blocked, the more cells may die. And you get non-contractile scar tissue, which greatly decreases the usefulness of the valve. Okay, valves, I mean, of the, of the muscle. Valves prevent backflow. The AV valves, atrioventricular valves, prevent backflow into atria. Right tricuspid, left mitral. And cordy tendinae are the little cord-like that anchor the valve cusps, which are the flaps, the papillary muscles. Now your semilunar valves prevent backflow when the ventricles relax. And we have our aortic semilunar valve and we have our pulmonary semilunar valve. And this is pictures of all our valves. We have our pulmonary valves here. You see you got three. In your aortic valve, you have three little uh, small valves here and you have this is just the top showing the cusps of the mitral and of the tricuspid and this is actually showing the tendinae and the papillary muscle and somebody got artistic and put a, uh, a light inside a dead heart a little out of my comfort zone if i were doing the picture but there it is neat kind of okay now this is showing what happens. Blood returns to fill the atria and pressure builds. Pencil's not working. There we go. Uh, pressure builds uh, against the valves. And so it comes in through the valves here. And it, over here, when the ventricles contract, you don't get backflow. See this little pouch prevents backflow so that you don't get flow back into the ventricles. Okay, and then the same thing happens when the ventricles contract. The blood easily flows through, but then when it's through contracting and relaxes, you don't get back flow. So you have one-way circuitry. Otherwise, you just have a sloppy mess that would not have anything consistent with life. This is something we studied in the section on tissues, but the microscopic anatomy of cardiac muscle. They're different than skeletal muscles. They're still striated, but they're not long. They're short, fat, branched, interconnected. And they do have the endomesium connects to the fibrous skeleton of the heart. That's just fibrous connective tissue. Still has T-tubules and sarcoplasmic reticulum which holds your calcium until contraction is needed. A lot of mitochondria, 25 to 35% of the cell volume. Now, when you have that level of mitochondria, you know that this cell is metabolizing, using a lot of oxygen and a lot of glucose. So it helps you understand why when a heart 
that's deprived of its oxygen and its glucose due to a heart attack, why that muscle dies so rapidly. Intercalated discs are actually junctions between cells. They anchor the cells, which are the rivets that help keep them from ripping apart. Gap junctions allow ions to pass. And this whole thing allows the heart to behave as a functional sentient, basically one functional unit. Here's our pictures of our little short cells. There's your intercalated discs here. Uh, this is showing what the desmosomes look like, gap junctions. This is showing a bigger picture of the heart. If you notice, a lot of mitochondria. We still have our A bands and I bands, our sarcomere, our sarcolemma, T tubules. This blue stuff is our sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, so it's different because they're short cells, though, and you have a lot more mitochondria. There. Now, the depolarization of the heart is rhythmic. It's also spontaneous. A lot of people don't realize that if you cut all the nerves to the heart, the heart's still going to beat. And about 1% of the cells have automaticity. That means they're self-excitable. And you have gap junctions that help the heart uh, contract as a unit. We start off with our sinoatrial node, SA node. On its own, it generates about seven, it fires like a little electrical pulse. 75 times a minute, that's our sinus rhythm. Depolarize faster on its own than any other part of the myocardium. Now, the reason your heart may not go quite that fast all the time is because that's moderated by uh, the vagus nerve putting out parasympathetic stimulation and slowing the heart down when it needs to be slow. Okay, it goes throughout the heart. We have a picture showing it in a minute. Uh, throughout the atria to the AV node, throughout both atria, and if the atria, the AV node is the only one firing, it will go 50 times a minute, maybe 40 times a minute. When you have seniors that have uh, very, very slow heart rates to the point that they're losing uh, circulation to their brain, they're fainting, and we put a pacemaker in them. Generally, what they're doing is they're running on their AV node, their SA node went out for whatever reason, old age, I suppose. Okay, then we have our AV bundle, also known as bundle of his, and this connects the atria and ventricles, and they branch off the right and left bundle branches. And we'll look at the pictures. Purkinje fibers go throughout the heart. Now, if the AV bundle and Purkinje fibers are the only thing causing depolarization of the heart, it's going to slow down to 30. Now, obviously, no one can live on a 30 beat per minute heart rate for long. Okay, this shows the whole thing. We have our SA node right here. I think I'll change colors. Let's go back to let's go to black. There we go. Our SA node is right here. And it initially depolarizes. Think about an electrical impulse. This spreads throughout the atrium. And then that comes together and filters back through this AV node. And notice these are both inside the right atrium. Now, you didn't see anything when you looked in your right atrium. That's why I made a big deal. You don't see this stuff on a dead dissection model. You just don't. Now, this uh, electricity, essentially, this depolarization goes down your AV bundle into your bundle branches. See how the bundle branches spread out? And then this goes out into your Purkinje fiber that cause the depolarization of the ventricles. Okay, defects in the conduction system. An arrhythmia is an irregular heartbeat. Uh, you can have discoordination between the atrial and ventricular contractions. Fibrillation is rapid, irregular contractions. Now, if it's atrial fibrillation, the atria is just kind of flopping along, not doing much, but the ventricles still pump sets you up for a uh, stroke, heart attack. It's, it's a big, bad thing for causing strokes. 
because of blood, you tend to get arterial clots when you have the atrial fibrillation. Ventricular fibrillation never bothers anybody for long because if it's not reversed, they die. It's one of those die now things because when the ventricles fibrillate, you get no beat, no functional beat at all. You don't get any movement into the lungs or into the body, any movement of, of the um, blood. Okay, a defective AV node, supraventricular tachycardia of the AV nodal reentrant type, if you want to get technical. You essentially have an ectopic focus. Basically, uh, could be a, a defective SA node or a defective AV node. Okay, if you have a defective SA node, uh, it, maybe it quits working. The abnormal pacemaker may take over and cause you to have tachycardia. If the SA node totally quits working, you're going to have a slow rhythm, a junctional rhythm. And the reason you get this slow beat is because you're running off the AV node. The AV nodal reentrant type was the one I intended to talk about, actually. Uh, some people, and it's actually quite common, and this is not in the literature, and the research has not been published, but I think you'll find someday that this is going to be a genetic thing, and it's going to be an autosomal dominant. Now, the reason it stays in the population is it doesn't bother you till you're an adult, and it usually doesn't kill you. But you have an extra AV node. You could get a partial or total heart block, but when you get supraventricular tachycardia of the AV nodal reentrant type, let's see if I can go back here, you actually have an extra little AV node somewhere. And the person will be rocking along nice just normal, maybe there'll be 30, maybe there'll be 50, or it could be a small child. And suddenly this extra little node here takes off and they may be doing 240 beats per minute. Now it doesn't take much imagination to know that 240 beats per minute is not good for the home team. Very, very dangerous. So what is done about this, and a cardiologist can't cure it, uh, normal a family practitioner can't fix it. If you have this problem or you know someone who does, they need to go to a cardiac electrophysiologist. I know Emory has got a good one. There may be some one at some of the other uh, places out there. They may even have one in Macon. I'm not sure. Uh, the Emory guy comes to Columbus a couple of times a month. But an electrophysiologist, what they do is they run a catheter up and through the inferior vena cava, they go in through the femoral vein, the inferior vena cava, and they come in to the atria, and they find that node by stimulating different places of the heart, and where it sets off that abnormal pathway, they then run a catheter in at, I'll give you a different color here, this will be our second catheter that has a little knob on it, that fries that using radio frequency waves. It's called an ablation. If you hear people say they've had an ablation, this is what they're talking about. And it actually is curative. It uh, generally lasts a long time. Okay, we're going to move on to extrinsic uh, innervation of the heart. It's modified by the autonomic nervous system. Cardiac centers are in the medulla oblongata. Now, that does not mean that you can't function without the medulla. The heart can keep beating if you supply ventilation to someone with a destroyed medulla or disconnect between medulla and the heart. If the vagus nerve, uh, the vagus nerve actually is cardio inhibitory, parasympathetic fibers slows the heart down. If you cut the vagus nerve, then the heart speeds up. Remember, sympathetic neurons are going to come from close. They're going to come off the thoracic spinal cord. That's why we call them sympathetic. And they're cardio accelatory. Now, this is all whenever you have a sympathetic uh, event. Let's say a bear is chasing you. First, your cerebral cortex is going to send a message. And it's got to be filtered through your uh, thalamus but it's going to end up in your medulla oblongata 
sympathetic neurons are going to get the message to speed that heart up. Now, this next picture to show you, uh, this is showing at the top here, this is supposed to be your medulla and your vagus nerve coming along here. And that is your parasympathetic nerve that decreases the heart rate. The sympathetic is coming directly off the spinal cord here, and it's going to decrease the heart rate. I mean, increase the heart rate. I'm sorry, I said it backwards. Sympathetic always increases the heart rate, and parasympathetic slows the heart rate. Maybe this will come up. Okay, an electrocardiogram, and the reason we call it an EKG instead of an ECG, which would not be correct, it's just not common commonly used, as this comes from the uh, German spelling of electrocardiogram. Okay, the P wave is when the SA node depolarizes. QRS wave, ventricular depolarization. T wave is ventricular repolarization. Okay, when we look at this, you can see you have your P wave, atrial depolarization. The QRS complex is your ventric ventricular depolarization. And then your ventricular repolarization is your T wave. So this would be a very normal EKG. Now I have this next picture. There we go. It's showing the details. If you notice highlighted in green here, you can see that the um, the, the area that's been simulated is noted. So the SA node fires, you're starting to get atrial depolarization, and you get this little loop in electricity we call the P wave. It reads off your leads. As it goes through and the atrial depolarization is complete, you get this little PQ interval, which is right there, it's in green. Then your QRS complex, which is the green here, is when you get your ventricular depolarization. You get the messages going here, but it goes through the apex and your depolarization starts here. Then as it's complete, you're gonna get this little interval between the S and the T wave. And then your T wave here is from ventricular polarization. Then the cycle is finished and you start the whole thing again. So this is a nice, normal EKG. We have a few abnormals here. This is a normal sinus rhythm. If you take note in this particular one, the P waves are not terribly large. They're hard to mark with this finger here. That was it. But they are present. So the P wave is before the QRS. That's your QRS. This is your T. And you know, normal. Junctional rhythm, if you notice, you have no P waves. So there's no bump right here, no bump right here. And this is because your SA node is not functioning. This is second degree heart block down here, number C. P waves are not being conducted through the SA node. So you get more P waves. So you skip some QRSs. So you have a P wave here. Whoops, let's see, try to get it there. Then you have a P wave there, and you skip uh, some uh, some QRSs. So this pointer does not wish to work very well. So here we have our P wave, our P wave, and then you get the QRS, and that indicates that um, some P waves are not being conducted through the AV node. So there's something going wrong in your PQRS interval. Ventricular fibrillation, this is also known as you are going to die, YGD. This is an abnormal electrical signal. It's chaotic. You get no heartbeat out of this. This is the one that you do the electrical stimulation, the defibrillation shocking. If the person is totally flatlined, unlike what one sees on TV, you don't shock them, you try to treat them with drugs, and chances are they may already be good and dead. Okay, heart sounds, you know, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That's what a heart sounds like, more or less. The first sound 
is the closure of the AV valves. The second is the closure of the semilunar valves. Now, a heart murmur is an abnormal sound. And we'll look at this next picture here. This is where you should hear the individual sounds the most. Um, you can hear them, if you have a severe mitral valve murmur, you can hear it through the entire thorax. You can see you have aortic pulmonary mitral tricuspid. If one has a murmur, what that means is that you have something wrong with that heart and you need an echocardiogram. We're in the 21st century and we say, oh, oh, I reckon you need some beta blockers. No, they need an echocardiogram to diagnose what is going on. If they have an abnormal valve, it may can be replaced. Uh, other things that can cause a, an arrhythmia, you could have a stenotic or closed down aorta, putting great turbulence in that left ventricle, and it's going to make a lot of noise. Now, um, I'm very good at diagnosing in uh, eight-year-old poodles mitral valve disorder because they sound like a washing machine instead of boom 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 it goes psh, psh, psh. that's a murmur for sure but you still to really get a good diagnosis you need an echocardiogram okay the cardiac cycle all the events associated with blood flow the consistency is contraction diastole is relaxation of the heart. Okay, cardiac output, how much blood the heart puts out, it's basically the volume of blood pumped by each ventricle in a minute. And it's dependent on the heart rate, how fast it goes, beats per minute, and the stroke volume, which is the volume of blood pumped out by a ventricle with each beat. So you may find a very athletic person has a slow heart rate because they have such a nice stroke volume, a very, very strong heart. Whereas a person in terrible shape, they may have to have a faster heart rate just to compensate for that weak heart. Now, things that modify the heart, the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic nervous system increases the heart rate does it several ways. And of course, we start with emotional stress or physical stress. Someone could be sick, it raises their uh, heart rate. Maybe they're in pain, it raises their heart rate. But norepinephrine directly causes the pacemaker to fire. And this is coming directly off the sympathetic neurons. We also have um, epinephrine is gonna be released from the adrenal gland. And that is going to go throughout the bloodstream. And epinephrine on a heart increases the heart rate. Okay, parasympathetic nervous system opposes the sympathetic nervous system. Rather than norepinephrine and epinephrine, it uses acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. This is parasympathetic. And the heart at rest exhibits what we call vagal tone that keeps the heart rate somewhat modified. If you cut the vagus nerve, the heart rate increases. Almost everybody, if they've never heard of this, if you say, what happens if you cut all the nerves to the heart? And they'll say, you die. Not necessarily. Heart rate may just go up. Okay. Now, another thing that the sympathetic nervous system is involved with is the atrial or Bainbridge reflex. This is a sympathetic reflex. As you get increased venous return, it stretches the atria and uh, the atrial walls. This stimulates the SA node and causes the heart to go faster. And you also have stretch reflexes that also activate sympathetic reflexes. So increase the heart rate to get more blood coming in. Hormones. Epinephrine increases the heart rate. Thyroid hormone, thyroxin, increases the heart rate. If someone is hyperthyroid, they're going to have a rapid heart rate. So that's one rule out for rapid heart rate. Uh, it also enhances the effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine. 
Now, ion concentrations have to be exactly right. If they're not right, uh, you've got a problem. Okay, decreased calcium depresses the heart rate, slow heart rate. It also causes depression of all your muscles and uh, except for the, you know, the respiratory muscles, the person may have some degree of a little slight seizure activity as they're dying. Increased calcium increases heart rate. And if you bolus intravenous calcium rapidly into your patient, you're probably going to kill them by causing that heart to go into spasticity. Don't do that. Increased potassium, arrhythmia, cardiac arrest. Decreased potassium, feeble heart rate, feeble heartbeat, arrhythmia, death. Either of them kill you. Now, causes of potassium changes. Uh, decreased potassium, one thing that causes that is if the patient is on diuretics and they're not supplementing that potassium. Uh, maybe they didn't know, but this is where as nurses, and other healthcare professionals, certainly be sure the patient is educated on that. Now, if the other drugs they have, such as Losartan potassium are given, then you won't want to supplement the potassium. Increased potassium, uh, renal failure patients is where I see this. Um, or if some um, I hesitate to use, well, I'll say incompetent person, I had a more name for them, puts potassium in an IV for the wrong individual, it, you'll have the same problem. You only use potassium if you document on blood work that one needs potassium. But for your patients, it's classic. The kidneys can't get rid of the potassium and you have enough potassium to kill your patient. Other things that affect heart rate, age. Very young individuals, the fetus is very fast heart rate. Gender makes a difference. Females have a slightly faster heart rate than males on average. Uh, exercise, as you exercise, it increases your heart rate. However, as you become, get in better shape, your resting heart rate may go down. As body temperature increases, uh, you're going to increase the heart rate as you get cold it decreases the heart rate so hypothermic patients will have a low heart rate okay tachycardia is uh abnormally fast resting heart rate anyone's heart rate will get to 100 if they're exercising but greater than 100 is standard in an adult if persistent if it's very fast it could lead to relation bradycardia slower than 60 beats a minute and you may not get enough circulation. Now, this is assuming that it really is a true bradycardia. Now, a person who has been doing tremendous amount of training may have such a good stroke volume that their resting heart rate is 55. But generally, uh, most of us aren't in that good a shape. So you've got to look at your whole patient. Okay, heart failure, congestive heart failure. We have several causes here. And when we're talking about heart failure, we're talking about the heart can't pump well enough to meet tissue needs. We're not meaning the heart stopped beating at all. It's just not working right. Coronary atherosclerosis, clogging of the coronary vessels with fat buildup, plaque. That's from eating anything that tastes good in the South. Barbecue, pig ribs, fried everything. Apparently. Those aren't healthy and they can clog up your arteries. Persistent hypertension will cause left heart hypertrophy and it can't work well anymore. Myocardial infarcts, heart attack. As you lose, you kill muscle tissue and it's replaced with scarring and the heart still can beat if it's you know, treated and it's not in the wrong place but it doesn't be efficiently, so the person is somewhat disabled. Dilated cardiomyopathy is interesting. This is your alcoholics, cocaine users, meth users, excessive stress for a lifetime, 
hyperthyroidism, some inflammatory diseases to cause this. And a new study in dogs has shown that uh, dilated cardiomyopathy has been associated with grain-free commercial diets. Now these are creatures that are eating the same thing all the time. So uh, don't buy that kind of dog food, but it makes us think about, should we go on all these grain-free diets as well? Um, in cats, taurine deficiency is absolutely shown to cause dilated cardiomyopathy. Cats without taurine in their diet, it's amino acid, will die at the age of 10 if they have the correct amount of taurine, which comes from fish protein, they'll live to be 20. Uh, no research has been done to show that that helps, that taurine is necessary to humans, but it does make one wonder if that's not one factor in making fish be so healthy. Now there's a genetic disease, genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is a dominant autosomal gene. Now most dominant genes are taken out of the population uh, by natural selection, but this gene doesn't show up often until you're an adult. An adult. Now, this is considered one of the number one causes of sudden death in young athletes. And uh, you hear about you know, the high school football player that was running and just doing just in great physical shape and dropped dead. And I've actually known two people, both were athletic, just died. Autopsy show their hearts were twice the size they should be. And that's not the thin heart like the dilated. The heart muscle is thick on both the left and the right heart. Okay, this is an interesting type, toxicocardiomyopathy. cardiomyopathy. This says described in 1990. I heard saw another source that said described in 2010. So it's a relatively new thing, but it's called the broken heart syndrome. Someone goes through an extreme stress. Oh, I should mention what a Takotsubo is. It's an octopus trap. I guess it has, this goes in it, he can't get out and you trap him and I guess people eat those things, I don't know. But you get ventricular damage, specifically left damage, secondary to extreme stress, dense needed, extreme stress, epinephrine overload. We had a student share that they had a family member whose spouse had died and they were in the hospital for weeks with this. Now this could happen, several things can happen with Takotsubo. Uh, the person may die rather quickly or within a few weeks. They may get totally completely well usually with treatment or they could have lasting damage. Generally, you either live or you die, which is nice. You don't want to be in between. Okay, the next, congestive heart failure. And all these heart diseases we're talking about, that's the kind of thing that um, causes these, that causes uh, congestive heart failure. Okay, it's when the blood circulation is inadequate to meet tissue needs. Coronary atherosclerosis, you have plaque buildup and in your coronary arteries. This is complicated by smoking and then it actually can cause heart attacks because you get uh, little inflammation areas in these coronary arteries that can be associated with bad teeth, rotting teeth. And you have a heart attack and uh, parts of the heart die. Persistent high blood pressure, untreated high blood pressure can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy, severe left ventricular hypertrophy. And in doing so, uh, this causes heart to beat inefficiently. And finally, it's just can't do well. The dilated cardiomyopathy, we've already talked about the many things that cause it, alcoholism, the one I'll mention now. And, um, it just makes the heart weak where they can't go, they can't keep working. Now, when you're thinking about congestive heart failure, if the left-sided heart quits working, okay, think back up a fluid. Left side behind the left heart, 
your lungs. Build up a fluid in lungs. You can hear crackling. If the right-sided heart is failing, fluid build up in the extremities, body organs. You have ascites. Your males may have large uh, external reproductive organs, and it can cause uh, eventually, you know, this leads to death. Okay, developmental aspects in the fetus. The fetus does not need to use its lungs because uh, it's all it needs to use the lungs for is growing because it's parasitizing off its mom, basically. The so valley is a hole between the two atria. This should close. If it does not close, then you have a heart problem. And also, we have our ductus arteriosus, which is a duct, a little vessel that connects the pulmonary trunk of the aorta. And there's, therefore, some of the blood that would have gone into the lungs goes on into the aorta. And uh, these are normal in the fetus. They close generally around the first breath, shortly thereafter. If not, you've got a problem. Okay, congenital heart defects. There's several we'll talk about, but you get maybe narrowing of valves or vessels, overload of the heart, and lead to systemic and pulmonary blood mixing. Okay, the first we'll talk about ventricular septal defects. See here you have anytime the heart beats, blood that should have been going out to the aorta gets recycled back through circulation, and this baby's not getting decent circulation. Next one, coarctation of the aorta. If you notice, it goes a little nicely, but then here you have a narrowing right here in your aorta. And this narrowing prevents uh, the blood from getting out properly, and you're going to get left ventricle workload, overload. Okay, and tetralogy of flow. It is a multiple defects, four of them. That's why it's called tetralogy. And Fallot is no doubt the person who came up with a description. But you have several things. The pulmonary trunk is too narrow and the valve is stenosed. So right here, narrowing. Okay, the second one, hypertrophied right ventricle. So see, these are going to be too big. I mean, sorry, this, I said left. <laughs> here is our right. It's too big and doesn't work properly. Okay, ventricular septal defect. The two ventricles mix blood. And the last one, the aorta opens from both ventricles. This is a very, very bad heart defect. I knew a family that had a child born with this heart defect and they had to do surgery on him in his first day or two of life to save him. He's had multiple surgeries and is actually doing very well. He's in school now. Okay, age-related changes affecting the heart. Uh, sclerosis and thickening of valve flaps. Declining cardiac curve. Fibrosis of cardiac muscle. Arthrosclerosis. Essentially, if you live long enough, your heart's going to quit working as efficiently as it once did. And it's another one of those things, just like skeletal muscles. If you don't use it, you lose it. If you sit on a couch and watch TV with your feet propped up, drinking beer and eating potato chips, uh, smoking cigarettes, if we want to add to it, that is not good for your heart. And it's, you're going to live nearly as long. Those few older people who get out, I remember an 80-year-old that used to run. I mean, and he ran fast. We do all we could to keep up with him. This was when I was in college, so I was, you know, 20. Run as hard as I could. No way to keep up with him. Uh, he did very well on up to 100 or so. We do have a time limit on how long we can live, but uh, the, long, the more you exercise and take care of your health, keep your blood pressure regulated, the less apt you are to have these age change, age-related changes earlier. That's all for now. Thank you very much.